Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Imperial Guard Tactics video. So today's video we're going to be talking about a rather interesting release from Forge World. Now Forge World have um, a line of models for obviously lots of 30k stuff and in, in that 30k range they have the Solar Auxilia which are basically the almost old school Im Imperial Guard sort of Imperial Army type people. And um, although they sort of wore, wore all enclosed void suit armor, very cool. Go and check it out. But that's not what we're going to be talking about today. Um, they sometimes release stuff that sort of can be used in both 30k and 40k, and most of the time this stuff is for Space Marines. But they recently released a new tank for the Imperial Guard, which has 40k rules. And I think it's very, very interesting. Now what it is, it is the Imperialis Militia Carnadon Battle Tank. And it looks like this. Uh, now I'm not going to lie, it's, its looks are not for me. This is very much a sort of Marmite tank. Either you love it or you hate it. Um, some people I know have seen this and have gone absolutely amazing. Me personally, uh, I'm not a big fan of its... Of its looks. Now, uh, I'm not going to get into the aesthetics of why or why, I'd, why why not I don't like it. It's just I don't think it looks very Imperial Guard like. But I guess at the end of the day, this is kind of like a 30k tank, which is being used by, which can be used in 40k. The justification for using it in 40k is is basically um, is basically that the it's an old reliable model of tank the the s in the time in the dark times that with the with the with the eye of terror exploding um the imperium is turning to sort of older uh mo models older units that they can just churn out quickly and easily um just to stay in the fight and one of the and one of the sort of tried and tested things that they used to use was the carnadon so they're bringing it back um, fine, that makes total sense to me. Uh, it's very like when you think about it. A lot of people go, oh, well, they've sat on this design for ages. Why wouldn't they use it? Well, because they genuinely have something better, which is the Lehman Russ. But it's very like the Imperium to look back rather than forward. You know, a race like the Tau, for example, if they, if they came up against a, a new threat, they would start devising new technologies uh, to, to and you know think out almost out outthink the way uh, try and outthink the new threat. Whereas the Imperium goes, no, we're not going to look to the to the future. We're going to look to the past. We're going to look at what sort of old, trusty, reliable things can we dig up that are actually pretty good. That's how the Imperium works. Things in the past are generally better than things in the future. Uh, which is why, I'm not going to get into this debate now, why some people don't like Primaris Marines. It goes against all that side. Okay, fine, whatever. So, you make your mind up whether you like the look of this thing. So, let's take a look at what it can do on the battlefield. So, we have the rules here. So, Cardons, hailing from the prehistory of the Imperium, the Cardon tank is a true relic of war. Those few that have survived the passion of the millennia are revered as links to the former incarnation of the Ashram Militarum, the mainstay of the Greek Crusade, the Imperial Army. With the hour so dark and the need for trusted war assets greater than ever, the priesthood of Mars has reinstated the STC for the Carnadon on several forged worlds, and under the light of the Great Rift, the ancient tank has trundled forth from the Manufactorums once more. Bristling with multi-lasers, the Carnadon is an ideal tool for, for mowing down elite infantry, blasting apart transports from crippling light tanks. It is respected as a fearsome asset for any armoured regiment. Carnadons are capable of mounting almost any heavy weapons of the Ashmo Arms Arsenal. More than that, they have the power, rich infrastructure and firing machine spirits needed to carry the little understood Volkite weaponry. Even those foes that cannot be laid low by high intensity lasers will be reduced to ashes by the deflagratory fires of a Volkite beam. Cool. Now, some of you straight away will have gone, uh, multi lasers, uh, don't like. Yes, true. But Volkite weaponry is very interesting. And that's not something I have personally used a lot, but I have, I have been on the receiving end of some Volkite weapons from the Adeptus Mechanicus, and I believe from Tartarus Terminators can also take like a Volkite blast as well. So I have a little bit of understanding of how Volkite stuff works, and it's quite interesting. Now, 
This thing costs 60 points base. Okay, I'm going to let that sink in for a little bit. Yes, we now have the ability to get a battle tank of some variety on the table for 60 points. If that isn't tickling you, if that isn't piquing your interest, then I will try even harder. So for your very modest 60 point investment, what do you get? Basically, you get a Rhino chassis. It's kind of like a Predator. You basically get an Imperial Guard Predator. So, but it's only got 10 wounds. But you've got the weapon skill 6, you've got the strength 6, toughness 7, 10 wounds, attacks 3, doesn't really matter, leadership, whatever, save 3+. plus. Now the save 3+, plus is very nice. Because one of the great strengths of the Imperial Guard is the ability to spam strength, uh, toughness, uh, it's not toughness, save 3 plus vehicles. Most of their armies can't do it quite to the extent that we can. And this thing lets us do it even more. So, uh, you only have a ballistic skill 4 plus, but you have a 12 inch movement. And because you've only got 10 wounds, it's one of those things where, yeah, you're going to die slightly easier. 10 wounds versus 12 wounds on a Leaving Rust, fair enough. But, and this thing is inevitably going to be compared to the Leaving Rust, even though that's not necessarily the correct way to look at it. Uh, because you only have 10 wounds, you degrade slightly differently. So you can take 5 wounds and then degrade. You only go onto your very last profile on 1 to 2 wounds, which is actually... You know, a really low amount. You, you know, you have to take eighty percent damage before that before you on what before you hit on a six plus. Now, this thing comes with two multi lasers and twin multi laser. I'm going to tell you straight off the bat: get rid, just get rid of two multi lasers and a twin multi laser. Just forget about it. Put it out of your mind. Multi lasers are awful. Okay. What you can do is you can swap your twin multi laser with a Volkite covering, covering, twin auto cannons or twin last cannon, and you can swap your two multi lasers, two heavy flamers, two heavy bolters, two Volkite cavaliers, two auto cannons or two last cannons, and it may take either a heavy stubber or a multi laser. That's right, guys. You can take a pintle mounted multi laser on this thing. So, interesting, shall we say. But no uh, storm bolter. So take that for what it is. Now, uh, this model reduces zero wounds, explodes, but if you notice, it doesn't have, and it only suffer models within six inches only suffer D3 mortal wounds. So that's good as well. Um, now, if you notice, it doesn't have the grinding and van special rule. So this thing, if you stay still, isn't going to get more shots. Not like a Lehman Russ. Okay. So, take that into account. Now, points-wise, you've got... There's basically... When I when this was first released, I saw a lot of people on Bolt of Chainsword saying this could be used as an alternative Lehman Russ Annihilator or Lehman Russ Vanquisher. Because what people were sort of thinking of doing is, is loading this beast up with, with Laz Cannons. And that's not a bad way to go about it. 40 points for a twin lance cannon, 40 points for two extra lance cannons. For 140 points, you can get yourself four lance cannon shots on a decent profile. And that's not a bad idea. But, you know, that's not a bad idea at all, considering when, if you look at the Annihilator, the US Annihilator, uh, it's 122 points. Then you have your, you have to spend 60 points for taking a lance cannon plus a twin lance cannon turret which is 182 points and then um you know you're you're getting you're getting five shots so this thing is this what the cacodon allows you to do is take four last cannon shots for 120 points versus the so 140 points versus the um annihilator's ability to take five well you know do five shots with the last cannon if you stay still um for 180 points. So basically, 40 points difference. You get one less leave, one less last cannon shot, and you're you're a bit you know you're you're easier to kill with with only 10 wounds and toughness seven. 
So, you know, that is, that is, you know, but in theory, these things could sit way behind the lines and, um, you know, they wouldn't be drawing as much firepower, you know, in theory. And you've got to say this thing is a bit more mobile than Lehman Russ. There's that big problem with the Lehman Russ where you don't ever want to move it more than five inches because you always want to get those extra shots. And we all know, uh, anyone who's using Lehman Russes for any amount of time, that the Lehman Russ is only one of the best tanks in the world because it gets to fire twice in it essentially has 2d6 battle cannon shots that's what makes a lemur so powerful the moment you start moving it all over the place it it starts becoming much less effective just a single d6 for the shots um you know much less effective so um it's it can be used as an alternative annihilator but the reason i don't like that is it is it's an alternative annihilator because it's still 140 points so it's still a big investment which means you're going to be replacing potentially Lehman Russes with these things instead, which I don't think is the correct way to do it. I think the correct way to do this is to have these things supplement your Lehman Russes. These things need to be taken in addition to in addition to your main armor. Because the whole point is, is that these things I don't know if this is the correct military term, so someone who has a bit more military lingo may know more about this than me, but I see these things as like cavalry tanks. I see these things as genuine medium armour for the Imperial Guard. Because when you think about it, the Imperial Guard doesn't really have any medium armour. It has the Limerus, which is very much heavy armour, slow, firepower, tough. And then you have light armour, which, which is fast moving you know we're talking chimeras we're talking toroxes we're talking you know hellhounds some people like to argue with medium armor but they're, they're not really because they're not like hellhounds aren't really like a tank are they they're a fast attack asset they're not really but they're not really a tank they are designed for getting up close and personal so i don't see the hellhound as a medium tank i see it as a as a, as a light as a light armor whereas i see this thing as medium armor because it's you know, yeah, it's just, it's it's still relatively tough. It's as tough as a as a as a hellhound or whatever, but it's not quite as manoeuvrable. But it brings more long range firepower. It is that line between light and medium armor. It has the durability of light armor with bordering on the firepower of heavy armor. To me, that is medium armor. That's just how it works in my head. Okay, so if you're going to be taking these things in addition to your um, Lehman Russes or other heavy firepower, you then you need to keep them cheap. Very cheap. Now, some people have said that the way to do this is to look at the twin auto cannon and double auto cannon option. For me, I'm not so sure. Okay, if you take your four auto cannons, you're looking at 108 points, which is nothing, you know, not a lot. 108 points for a bit of heavy armor. Jesus Christ, the space marines are weeping looking at this thing. This thing can do what a Predator can do, practically. The only thing is, is that the Imperial Guard kind of already has a good alternative to the Lehman Russ uh, Exterminator, to the Autocannon Spam, and that is the Imperial Knight Helverin. Now, yeah, you can take probably, you can pretty much take two of these things for one Helverin, roughly, but the Helverins are just, are just generally better. They've got more wounds, they've got better ballistic skill, they can put out more shots. These things are putting out eight shots. The Helvins are putting out at least eight, potentially way more. Um, and they're faster with a longer range. I just... And, the, and to be honest, the Imperial Guard aren't really short of autocans, especially, you know, since, you know, me personally, I've been putting a lot of autocans in my infantry squads recently, and it's been doing really, really well. So, yes, as an autocannon spamming unit, very, very good, because... It has it just has that ability. It has the um it, it's cheap, tough, and autocans are great. However, I think you're missing it we're missing a trick if we take this as an autocannon spam unit. We already have plenty of access to autocannons. I think the way to look at this is to take the Volkite weaponry. One rule of cool, Volkite is awesome. And we don't have any other real chance to take it. But two Taking a look at the Volkite weapons, 
there's actually very little reason to not take them. Okay. You see, what's the big weakness of the auto cannon? The big weakness is that strength 7. Now, against some targets, strength 7 is fantastic. You know, strength 7 is, is you know, really good at sort of killing. It's, you, you need that strength 7 when you sometimes come across, you know, rhinos or, you know, any sort of space marine armor. But let's be realistic. Space marines, whilst common, are not the most competitive army out there. And as always, I do like to try and keep this channel looking at competitive choices. And so what's one of the main things you're going to be facing in the meta these days? You're going to be facing uh, Custodes. You're going to be facing Talos. You're going to be facing... Uh, but in terms of vehicles, which is what this thing... You know, what, what Volker weapon would be quite good at dealing with. You know, you're looking at, like, Eldar vehicles. You know, Dark Eldar are the top army at the moment. And knights as well. So these things are as just as good at taking on knights as uh, as auto cannons. They can take on custodes and talos pretty much the same. I believe custodes and talos are toughness five, toughness six. So you know the auto cannon can wound slightly better, but this thing has the ability to do some serious mortal woundage. Okay, and that's kind of where it balances out. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's strength six, the Volkite weaponry. But against most, if you want to use this thing to hose down infantry with the Volkite weaponry, there's no difference between taking an auto cannon and taking a, a Volkite weapon in terms of wounding. And at wounding light vehicles, there's still no difference. And it's only when you start getting into medium armor that you might struggle. But there's not a lot of medium armor out there at the moment. So, there you go. So what does the Volkite weapon do? Well, it's the Volkite Cavalier. It's got a 30-inch range. It's heavy 2. It's strength 6, AP minus 1, 2 damage, which is very nice. And if each time you make a wound for this weapon on a 6+, plus, the enemy takes a mortal wound, in addition to any of the damage, which is great. The Volkite Culvin, which is the turret, is heavy 4. Strength 6, AP minus 1, 2 damage. But if you get that 6, each time you make a wound on a 6+, plus, the enemy takes D3 mortal wounds. Now, considering you're going to be firing 8 shots from this thing, and considering you're going to be having, hopefully, 3 of them, that's 24 shots. There are ways to make this thing, you know, hit quite hard. There's definitely some potential for, I'd say, 2, 3 mortal wounds to be dealt. At least a turn with these guys. Now the only so the downside is the you know it's slightly less strength than the auto cannon. Okay, fair enough. It's got the same rate of fire. Fair enough. Maybe the biggest weakness of the Volkite weapons is the short-ish range. Short-ish range is a problem. Um, there's no way of denying that. But I think that. If we're looking at this, I think this unit is really, really good as a medium tank. I think it's really, really good. I I think I might get some. The only reason I might not get one, this is the only reason, is because A, I'm trying to focus on some getting my other armies done at the moment. I'm trying to focus on some Gene Zilla cult, some World Eaters, to have some bad guys for the channel. Uh, and two, I own a stupid amount of Lehman Russes. Like, I own like 20 or something. Just something ridiculous. So... Do I really need any more armor? Maybe not. I'll definitely proxy these though for a while. And if they come out good, then I'll definitely, you know, I'll definitely, I'll definitely get some. Now, what regiment would I use with this thing? Because this, that's the key I, to making this thing extra competitive, is choosing the regiment. Now, as with any vehicle, I think this thing... Uh, that almost any regiment will work with this thing. But what we have to understand is that it doesn't have the highest rate of fire. If you look at a Liam Russ Exterminator, for example, that thing, if it stays still, is going to get eight shots with the auto cannon, which is the same as this. And if you have three heavy bolts on it, nine heavy bolts shots. So... 
you have we have to try and make this you know it's it's it doesn't quite have the same fire output but it neither should it because it's only 100 points for this thing um i probably wouldn't pay for the heavy stubber by the way or the multi laser because i just wouldn't the multi laser is rubbish i wouldn't pay for that pintle mount thing or the heavy stubber i just wouldn't bother not on this tank so i think though that one thing that might be very useful thing is the talon um especially if you're thinking volkite weaponry it's a talon trait because it means you can move which this thing has a 12 inch movement so it's got a rapid movement which means you can get those short range shorter range volkite weapons in range quicker and you won't take the penalty for it so talon's a good one katachan has pretty much no point because there's no random dice roll weapons here Cadians, I think, are probably one of the best. Okay? Uh, because you can put three of these things down. If you stay still with them, you get a natural reroll one to hit. And if you um, then use overlapping fields of fire, you can start getting these, three, these things to hit on threes. Hit, hitting on threes, rerolling ones. You're just going to have... There's a high, high chance for you to do some mortal wounds with the amount of shots you're going to be making. So, yeah. I think to, to take advantage of the mortal wound ability, you want to go Cadians. If you want to be running all over the place with this thing, take Talans. Steel Legion would be good-ish because of the eight, ignoring the AP-1. And considering this thing is quite light armor, it's probably going to be drawing the attention of most of your enemy's AP-1 kind of weapons. Most people shoot like las cannons at Lehman Russes, but in my experience with Steel Legion, with my lighter armor, they tend to try and grind it down with assault cannons and bolters. They'll probably do the same thing to these units when they find out they're 27 with 10 wounds. So having they ignore AP-1 will be a big help. The other one, well, Vestroian would be good because you can use Vestroian Pride to make one of them hit on a 3+, plus, but it's not, good as, it's not as good as Cadian, so I'm not sure. An interesting wildcard one here would be Valhallen. You see, Valhalla, you round, you, you, you know, you double the amount of wounds you have to determine what weapon profile you're on. So, before you degrade even one level, the enemy's got through seven wounds to you, taking advantage of that, of that degrade, uh, degrading profile you have. Because if you take seven wounds, you're on, you've got three left, you double that, you've got six, you're on six or ten wounds. So, before the enemy can degrade you at all, they need to do 70% damage to you. I think Valhalla is a very interesting one here, more so than on the Lehman Russ. So that's it, basically, guys. Now, some of you, there is one. That's it for the tactic side of things. Now, there is one huge blot, one huge fly in the ointment, shall we say, and that is the price, the physical monetary price of one of these bad boys. So if you may have noticed it before, it is a cool £68, not including postage. That is expensive, to say the least. And I know Ford, I'm not, I'm not getting into this debate. There's a lot of drama in Ford to get at the moment. But Ford will apparently charge you way more if you buy from overseas. So this is, some of you were saying, well, I can't, I just can't do this. Like, I can't do it. This is, this is too much. Calm down. Morning Glory has got you sorted. I would not buy one of these from Forge World. I would convert my own. Okay. Now, even it's still going to cost you a little bit of money. But it's not going to cost you much more than a Lehman Russ. So, put it that way. I would start by choosing a cheap armor base, Imperial Guard armor base. Just a cheap a cheap bit of Imperial Guard armor. And what is cheaper than a Chimera? Now, for those of you, now there are plenty of discount. Now, you could buy a Chimera from Games Workshop and spend £22.50 on it, or whatever the equivalent is in your local currency. Or you could go to a discount retailer and get 20 to 25% off and save yourself a bit of money. One that I have used in the past multiple times and I've had no issues with, they're a little slow to get the model to you, is Triple Helix Games. Now, these guys will sell you a Chimera for £16.88. You'll save yourself over a fiver. Pretty good. I would start with that. 
I would then... Now, some of you are saying, but the Chimera, right? Uh, no sponsors. Don't worry, I'll have you covered again. Now, you can convert the turret if you want to try and make it look more like a Volkite Blaster. Or you could buy... Th or, but the thing is... Is it still going to look like a Chimera? We want this weapon, we want this tank to look significantly different from a Chimera. You know, that's what we want. That's that's the plan, right? So, what you could do is buy yourself a third-party turret. Now, ones that I think would look particularly good would be the ones from Cromlech slash their bit slash bits of war. Now, again, there's probably plenty of uh other choices you can go for this is just one that i came across and i would look at something like the twin heavy assault tank turret with the heavy heavy flamer that looks kind of volkite you know hot flames it doesn't really look like a games works on heavy flamer you've got lasers i would maybe not go for the gatling ones maybe go for the twin Melter turret or the twin plasma turret, but you get the idea. But these guys also sell sponsons. And if you're looking at Volkite sponsons, well, these things look pretty Volkite to me. You know, they look pretty interesting. So, a couple of these, if you imagine on the side of the Chimera, here, you know, about here, that big fat turret up top, you can. Uh, if you inverse the las guns, they won't look like you know they won't, they won't look like a camera. Or just or just leave them off, or cover them up. It's the same thing for that. You just cover that bit up, or if you magnetize all this, you could you'll still have yourself a chimera. And that's it, basically, guys. And so, how much does that all come to? Well, if you buy a chimera, and you buy sponsons, and you buy a turret, the sponsons are all eight pound seventy. The turrets are all eleven pound thirty-one. If you get the discount chimera. That comes to £36.89. £37. So for £37, which is only, what, like six, five pounds fifty more than a Lehman Russ? Six pounds more than a Lehman Russ? That's not bad. That's, pretty, you know, almost half price on Games Workshop. So, and you'll have a really cool looking unit to boot. So, that's how I would do it. That's how I do it. And, and also, a lot of people say, you know, these days don't like chimeras. A lot of people don't use them. So if you've got a bunch of chimeras lying around that you're not doing anything with, why not convert them? Why not buy a couple of, you know, an extra turret, a couple of extra sponsons, blue tack them on the side for all I can, magnetize them on the side. It doesn't matter. You can turn those chimeras from potentially not very good units to fantastic units. Now, these things can't be squadron, but you can take three of them in your army. And I think an enemy is going to really struggle to deal with three to four. You know, if you're spending about a thousand points of your army on your armored section, that will get you easily four Lehman Russes. I mean, that's easily for you, considering the average cost of Lehman Russes is 180 points. That would be four Lehman Russes and three of these things. That's seven bits of serious armor. You then slap on 100 to 150 infantry. You're still going to have 500 points for officers and special bits that you want to use. For the fluff bits. So, seriously consider this thing. It's got decent maneuverability, decent armor, decent firepower. It's really cheap. Strat not stratagems, uh, well, stratagems and regiments make it competitive, and you can buy an alternative version as well, a bit of converting, and you have, you've got a nice little addition to your army for a very respectable price. So, thank you guys for listening. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video, and I'll see you guys next time.